basically what we've done is we've taken Tom away from getting his final signature to come down here and talk about some of the work he did. The, the actual work he did at Virginia Tech was a, largely focused on open BTS, but along the way he gained some insight into um, some of the NEON stuff and some TIDSP stuff on the E100 and some other processors. So without any more, here is Tom. All right, how's that sound? All right. Okay. All right, so as Phil said, uh, mainly, hopefully I'll answer some questions that, uh, that, that Phil kind of touched on earlier um, as far as optimization goes. Um, some things I'm going to cover. Uh, we'll touch on floating point, because that's primarily what we deal with on GNU Radio. So that's really going to be the focus on this, uh, and Core A9 uh, preceded by A8, and also fixed point on DSP, because uh, I know this, this comes up a lot, so I wanted to touch on that as well. So what's the real question here? Why is my embedded code so slow? Uh, I mean, the easy answer is there is, is because, well, it's an embedded processor. It's not, it's not an x86. It's going to be slower. But for if you spend a lot of time on this, you kind of wonder, you drop, you lower your expectations, and you realize, that's just really slow. It's like, oh, it's like even more than you would really expect going from uh, x86 to core, you know, that your, your phone runs these, but it still seems slow. So, and, and to get touch on that, we kind of have to go through some quirks of the architecture. Um, ARM is not the most straightforward thing when it comes to an architecture standpoint, especially in floating point. Um, so that's kind of the gist of what I'm going to cover here. Uh, and, and there's really too much that we can really cover in 45 minutes at this point. So feel free to, if you want to uh, emphasize any sections, uh, feel free to raise your hand at any time. So ARM floating point. There's, there's two ways to do ARM uh, floating point on ARM. Uh, I'm going to specifically talking about Cortex A8. Um, and A9 uh, eventually, but as Phil mentioned, there's a vector floating point unit which has the most confusing name in the world at this point because it is not a vector unit. Uh, and to, re to ask why that is, you have to go a little further back and uh, look somewhat historically on that. Um, so I believe the, the time frame is roughly ARM 9 or ARM 10. Don't, don't quote me on that, but um, at one point, the floating point unit came along and then there was a vector implementation of it. Now, vector does not imply SIMD. You can have a serial implementation that optimizes for vector performance. That doesn't have to be SIMD in terms of data level parallelism. And that's how the first vector unit actually came across. Now, I don't know exactly what happened to that, that there are apparently some limitations. And then we had the SIMD approach, and this is what we have as a, as a NEON unit. Um, 128-bit registers. We can do quad multiplies when it comes to floating point. Um, and the original one kind of just got deprecated. Uh, it, it is officially deprecated in RMB7. So this non-vector floating point unit is, is truly a non-vector unit now, but the name uh, still kind of hangs around. And the reason for that is because the instruction set is still the same. So it's still a... Uh, Right now, we're at v, VFP3, or V3. And um, so that, that kind of sticks. So that's why we have that kind of really confusing scenario. And it, it really kind of messes with your mind when you're actually going to the TRM. And it tells you the vector unit, but it's not really referring to the vector unit. So with well, that cleared up, that the vector unit is really a scalar unit, you do have the true NEON unit. Um, and Philip touched on that. It's NEON. The differences between the two, NEON is really designed for multimedia. So think high bandwidth. Um, not looking for, say, the, the rounding uh, that you might get in, say, numerical processing, where you really need something like accurate. Now, you won't do doubles, only single point. Go ahead. You're kind of touching on this. Mm -hmm. If I had to do I triple E, whatever standard compliant arithmetic, which unit would I use? Yes. So if you look at the core eight, um, looking at some of the differences. Sorry. Sorry. So if you really want something compliant that you need, just floating point unit accuracy. You're not looking for just bandwidth. 
then you would use the vector floating point unit, aka the scalar unit. Um, IEEE 754 compliant, and it covers a, a larger amount of operations um, that you wouldn't necessarily do in the high bandwidth application. Square root, for example, 35 cycles. Don't do that in, if you're doing that in SDR um, in your main, you're probably doing it wrong. You don't need to do a quad square root operation. You probably shouldn't be doing it at all. Um, so now this is important. The vector pulling point unit, the scalar unit in Cortex A8 is not pipelined. So that has some serious implications coming up. Um, and it's not the fastest, it's actually called V. Yes, Matt. Yes, I'll cover that in GCC, but yeah, generally, yes. Uh, you won't see the neon being used unless you, unless you go to intrinsics, at least with GCC. You might have better luck with uh, some of the other Apple compilers, for example, Code Sorcery. You might have some luck there, but with GCC, you will not see neon use straight out of GCC. If you pass the right set of flags, F-tree vectorized won't do it. You, you can pass the right set of flags, and it will use neon for single precision, non-city. Yeah, it won't vectorize, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Neon, in comparison, is 10-stage pipeline, uh, single precision. It doesn't support as many operations, but it supports the ones that matters. Vector multiplies, vector adds. Um, and it is pipeline, so we, what we really want to see is we want to see single cycle latency, like instruction, instruction, output, output, output. We don't want to see any stalls. We want to see pipeline to output. Every cycle, we want to see output. And Neon does that. It has that capability, for the most part. So canonical, or just the, the basic signal processing, the multiply, accumulate, filtering, correlation, we see this all, all the time, especially uh, SDR. It's just kind of a keystone here. Simple for loop. Uh, Matt touched on GCC, GCC, so where do we really get with that on GCC? Well, here's what's, this is straight out of the, uh, the TRM. So I already mentioned that GCC won't vectorize on the NEON unit. So we see something that looks like this. Um, a multiply and two multiply accumulates. And from the TRM, look at the cycle counts. I, you know, I said before we want one instruction, one instruction, one cycle count, output, 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 we have seven cycles, 11 cycles. That use not, it's not a pipeline unit. So you have an output, you have some dependencies, you have to wait. You push it through, you wait. You push it through, you wait. So this is probably one of the main reasons why we look at Cortex-A8. Um, if GCC is going to use, not, is going to use the, uh, the v, um, the, uh, uh, the vector floating point unit, the, not the neon one, it's not pipelined. So you're kind of stuck with this. And the numbers show it, too. So this is just, I took an x86. Uh, in this case, it's an AMD Phenom. Just, this is just a relatively not too old, not, definitely not blazing fast by current standards. It's a machine someone gave me for free. Um, compared to GCC ARM on... Um, this is for, was originally uh, GSM oriented, but 10,000 convolutions, uh, four samples per symbol, so that's roughly, uh, that's roughly 600 or so samples, and convolved were a length between four and 32. And the gap is pretty large. It's roughly around 40. So we're at a 40 uh, slowdown here on, on the deficit. Um, and large part of that is because, well, we're, well, we're not use, GCC won't use the neon, and it's using a scalar unit that's not pipelined. It's, it's not going to be fast. The architecture just won't let it go. So if you want neon out, you have to practically use, for vector operation, you have to use intrinsics. Now, this is just what one looks like. Um, there's always a the question intrinsics versus assembly. Because assembly, uh, intrinsics really just export the, uh, the assembly operations out anyways. And 
What this gives you is, with intrinsic, it gives you type safety. Now, that may be a good or bad thing, because what you don't get here is you can't actually manipulate registers. You don't know what register goes where. You just have types. And if we took the same loop and we put intrinsics in there for a quad operation, it gets, we're getting there. It's better. But if you looked at what that gap was for, we had an order of magnitude, around 40x down, uh, or 40x up from the x86 case. We're slowly getting there. This, this is a little over two and three times speed up. Not bad, but it's not, not really what we really want to see as far as anything big. So to think about this some more, uh, we deal with complex values and uh, complex multiplies. Um, INQ signals and doing radio, uh, or signal processing in general. So um, think of this in the, in the basic uh, complex delay tap line. Um, now I put this up here because um, it makes sense to think of not so much in a for loop, like a dot product or code, but you think it more mechanically. You have, uh, you have your taps, and we all know from uh, signals and systems, you have your, your data, and you can follow it across. You slide it. So if you think in kind of how you would implement it in, say, directly working with hardware, you would keep your taps in place, and you would slide your data through. Now, you're not really guaranteed anything. You can't really do that in code. You don't really know what the code's doing with, with the GCC output. It could be loading these values. You have these tap values. It could be loading them. It could be writing them out. It can be moving them to a different register, writing it out, and putting it back into one. So you have all these loads, and you can't really control them until you start getting into uh, assembly. Um, so when I talk about these loads, uh, we get some pretty powerful operations that we can do with, with NEON in terms of assembly. Um, ARM is a load store architecture, and by that it means every operation you do involves load in the store. If you want to add two numbers, one plus one, you load that in the register, you add it, you do an explicit store. x86 is a little bit more flexible there. Um, but we have these neat ones here with ARM that we have, uh, we deal with I and Q, we can actually load and de interleave in the same operation and do that in quads. So here's a, a double one. So, and these come in pretty handy. Um, I think if you're dealing with intrinsics, my opinion, these operations are pretty limited because you don't know what the registers are doing. So um, you kind of have to uh, get into the simile when you start doing things like this. And what might one of these actually look like? Um, I'm not going to walk through this now. It's not really quite the place, but I'll be around tomorrow if you want to go uh, into more detail about this. But I just wanted to like, show what uh, a piece of assembly here actually looks like. We have VLMA, multiply accumulate operation in NEON, and quad, quad, uh, quad registers, Qs. These are quad 128-bit registers in NEON, and we do four operations at a time when I multiply. Um, and again, the notable thing here is you can explicitly specify where you want registers or what store in registers, and it won't leave that until you explicitly unload it. So nothing really gets swept out from underneath your feet when you're dealing with these assembly cases. And if we do that, we control registers, we don't do unnecessary loads and stores, we start seeing something pretty substantial. So now in this case, we actually jump up to about a 12x improvement uh, if we do the unnecessary loads um, from uh, just a full dot product. So now we're getting somewhere. So key point here is when we're dealing with NEON and assembly, you have to keep in mind it's not just the quad operations, it's just not cutting down on the multiplies. It's actually cutting down on the, the load stores and only really loading what you really need to load and being able to manipulate that. And that's something that ARM is, or uh, GCC is not, not always the greatest at, um, which is understandable because it doesn't really know everything that you want it to do. Uh, you, don't, you don't deal with the actual registers with GCC. Um, now there's more. Multiply accumulate operations. Now, this is the quirk of the Cortex-A8. Uh, the TRM says, 
a multiple accumulate followed by a neon floating in point instruction with a read after write hazard will solve for eight cycles. Now, what does this mean? Uh, we do convolution or product. We do multiply, accumulate, multiply, accumulate, multiply, accumulate. But if you want to do these kind of in the most intuitive way, it's going to solve for eight cycles. So what can we do about that? Or you know, how can we illustrate that more? Um, and here is just kind of an instruction. Uh, you probably can't read that. But you see you have this dependency on the multiply, accumulate. You sum into the accumulator. And you use that value to get on the next operation, but you can't cortex a there is that eight cycle stall. So this this is kind of a problem. But how do you address that? Well, this is one thing about um, on the current generations of ARMS and Intel actually. Uh, multiple accumulate operations are not. It's not really what it is. It's just a multiply and accumulate. The operations are still the same. They're just concatenated. And uh, you save roughly about one cycle on them. So it's, it's not in the current generations of processors where we have a fuse multiply accumulate where the whole thing actually happens in one operation. Um, that will happen in A15. So we can address that by separating out our multiplies. We don't do multiply accumulates. We actually do our multiplies. Then we sum. And... We, so we don't really have those dependencies anymore. If we can get rid of those dependencies, we can get rid of an eight-cycle pipeline stall, and we get a lot more instructions that way. So what I'm getting at here is usually it's a pretty good idea to optimize to reduce your instruction count. It makes sense. If you don't have to do instruction, then leave it out, and you'll save time. But we wind up with some quirks. Um, especially multiply accumulate, because we use them so often. Uh, and A8 is not particularly good at this. But if we actually split that up and go more instructions, we actually can squeak out another speed up. So now we went from, uh, we got roughly a two, three speed up when we went to intrinsics, roughly about 12 or so when we went to uh, optimized assembly implementation. And we can push it out to closer to roughly six, uh, 18 or so, actually. So just shy of a 20x speed up from our, our original case um, when we actually start doing assembly and taking, taking account of these kind of pipeline um, things that are very, really just specific to the A8. So those speed ups in summary. You know, we started out with a pretty, pretty pretty far off from an x86 case. You know, we, we expect, again, we expect it to be far, but like this is way out there. And we cut that down by 2, 12, 18, 18x 18 speed up, so not bad. Um, and how does that compare to the x86 case again? Um, we actually start creeping up uh, within, a sing within a single value multiple of the x86 case. Now, of course, it's not entirely fair because we have this highly optimized ARM case and we're comparing against just what GCC spits out for x86. If we take the similar approach to x86 and we see that gap widen a little bit more. But, um, but in general, we see this general case in the Cortex A8. You can really get some pretty, pretty substantial gains when you move to assembly cases. Uh, I saw 18 here. Um, some other people I've talked to, it's not uncommon to within the range of roughly 10 to 30 X improvements. Um, and again, a large part of that is, is due to the, the floating point unit. You know, it, it's by itself what GCC optimizes for is not really the, the most effective processor or the floating point unit. So what can this thing do? So uh, again, I came to this from looking at this from GSM. So once all that's kind of said and done, we can actually push through. Uh, this is just an example of what I was able to push out. Um, two megahertz signal uh, synthesis filter. So opposite of a channelizer. Uh, five channels, roughly 400 kilohertz. And um, I turned on the three middle ones. So we can start getting into a multi-carrier. Now, this is transmit only. So the bulk of this would be on the receive side in terms of OpenBTS. But, 
we can actually start pushing three channels out and get, at least from a transmit side, some, some direction towards multi-channel cases. So uh, it's, for various applications, this could be very useful. But to get there, you really have to, you need some amount of neon, and you can't expect, uh, Philip Gonnell, you can't really expect much from GCC in these cases, at least on Cortex-A8. Um, before I move on, any questions about that? Hold off on that comment, not for A8. Um, the A9 case is particularly interesting. One of, the part, one of the aspects of GCC, well, the biggest thing with GCC is non-vectorizing. Um, I am not entirely convinced we'll see huge changes in that. I think there are still open research areas in that. But the, the open question of just how do you vectorize or automatic vectorization of code is not straightforward. Um, I think there will be some lag on that, is, is my personal opinion. Now, there, there is some subtle stuff there as well. Uh, it's not, in terms of vectorization, it's also limited on x86. But if you fall back to the non, the scalar cases, um, that, the scalar case on x86 is quite optimized. Uh, and we find almost the extreme case on ARM Cortex-A8, where you have, you fall back to the scalar, valid, the, the scalar case, and it's, it's the opposite of being optimized. It's not even pipelined. So if, if that's your fallback case, then you're kind of up against a wall as far as GCC goes, until GCC starts optimizing for NEON. And again, at this point, it, it really doesn't in terms of vector performance. Now, there are some quirks for A9, which uh, I can touch on here. Um, so I said in A8, one of the, the biggest issues is you have GCC going towards the non-vector unit. And the non-vector unit is not even pipelined. That changes in Cortex-A9. So this is a huge change. And the other big change is out-of-order execution. I didn't really touch on this one much, um, or I didn't bring it up for A8. But A8 is not is in-order execution only. Um, and some more subtle changes to the NEON unit. Um, and the effects here are, are mainly uh, on GCC. There will be huge effects on GCC. And the floating point unit, um, thankfully, Neon or uh, ARM is a little bit better as far as naming goes. If you look at the TRM, they refer to the vector floating point unit as just the floating point unit now. So this is much more sane just from that, just in terms of abbreviations. This, it's, this helps out a lot. It's, it's a small change, but <laughs> it does help. And then, uh, but again, I mentioned before, the, the instruction set is still the same, but you know, we can kind of sweep that and not really worry about that one too much. Um, so, on, again, in terms of the scalar unit, we get quite a bit. The big change is pipeline now. And that's important because that's what GCC will optimize for. It will, and then um, and we have some general latencies cut down at all um, in general. So, in terms of A9, the changes in the, in the, the non-vector unit, the floating point unit, are much more than you'll see in the actual NEON unit itself. Uh, the NEON unit... Uh, subtle changes. These would definitely be incremental. Um, in the non-vector unit, uh, pipelining is a pretty big deal. Um, we don't have any of that kind of same order of magnitude changes on the, the NEON side. Um, we do have a, a slight advantage on the multiple accumulates. I mentioned we had that eight cycle stall, uh, which is Cortex A8 specific. That is resolved. So. Um, that, that, again, kind of makes things more sane in terms of we don't have to go through these breaking up our multiple accumulates to do these explicit pipeline optimizations. Um, A9 should be better about that. So, again, the effects of this RNA9 is A9 will be immeasurably a lot more effective to, to generate code for on GCC. Because, again, GCC generates code for the non-vector floating point unit. And that's where we see huge improvements. Pipelining, reduction of uh, instruction timings. Um, Neon is, again, more subtle. We see some things carry over. But the same, the same hand-optimized code will still work. But don't expect to see, like, 20 
30 times improvements going to uh, assembly optimization on A9. So before we switch gears, I'll, I'll stop. We'll kind of take a pretty big jump at this point. So I guess, yeah, go ahead, question. Painful, very painful. Doubles are, I mean, that's, that's certainly a problem. For, I mean, that's not something the ARM will address. Um, the only, again, the Neon does not support double. So you have absolutely, you have no hope of, there is no hope of vectorizing it. There is no hardware support for it. You can't, there is nothing to optimize for there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I will. Mm -hmm. Subtle changes in the neon, though, would show up if we wrote bulk functions for the A8 and the A9. So this seems like a good candidate for this, you know, neon for A8 and neon for A9, different proto kernels in bulk. To the yeah, I, I think the bigger change there would be because um, remember, A9 more or less kind of addresses that efficiency we can kind of get around by breaking things up. So. Um, No, I think it's the other way. If you optimize, AA will carry, it's the other way around. The AA will carry over and then, yeah. Yeah, a, and, and A9 in general is just easier to optimize for, whether you're talking just, just GCC, as I mentioned, or Neon, it's just easier to work because you don't have these, just, you don't have to go through the um, TRM and then for multiply accumulate on A8, there's an asterisk there. And it says, well, th these are the limitations. An eight cycle stall in this case, a four cycle stall in this case, in this case it won't stall. That goes away in A9, or at least they don't have the asterisks there. <laughs> I haven't actually I haven't actually measured anything on A9, so I can't say for sure. But I mean, at least based on the TRM, those magic asterisks are gone, thankfully. Yes. You made a few comments about GCC, but there's also the C lang compiler or Clang compiler. Do you have any experience? Uh, that I do not. Um, but just, again, speaking kind of in general, there are better compilers out there. Um, this is another area where we kind of have some big differences between x86 and ARM. Um, kind of uh, for a while, like I would say in x86 in most cases and just general application-wise, I wouldn't try to beat GCC with, you know, kind of manipulating it, doing, going behind the scenes and trying to manipulate GCC um, on x86. ARM, it... Usually, I would almost like incline you to t take these things in mind. Look at the assembly. Is it is it even sane? I mean, just do a sanity check. Is it is it just doing something that seems ob I mean completely silly? Because it, it can do that sometimes. That's, that's even a question for Radio on x86. Since I don't yeah. Know with LLVM. We know ICC does the better job. Mm -hmm. But one good example there is on the vectorization. Um, again, GCC won't do it. Some other ones will. I don't know how well those work, but just by the fact that they actually will vectorize, uh, that would be an improvement, or there should be an improvement at least. Um, but I, I, I would be curious to see. Um, uh, I don't know about Clam, but some of the commercial ones, for example, the, uh, the non-free compilers, I would be uh, personally curious to see how they do. Yes. 
Exactly. Exactly. They will be relatively similar. A8 will not get worse. Or it will not get worse when you go to A9. A8 op will not get worse. To put it that way. A9 to A9 may. It's possible. Uh, sorry, say that again. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that that is the main focus right now. I mean, before I mean, before you start worrying about subtle differences between A nine A eight, um, look at neon. And certainly, if the with A9 you can actually again you, as you as you said you can you can kind of expect more from GCC, and depending on your application that may be enough, um, and so you may not need to. I think the short answer is don't obsess over the differences between A8 and A9. Just assume the A9 is going to be better, right. and anything you do is going to make it better on both. So now um, th this comes up a lot, so I wanted to touch on this. But uh, the E100, the DSP on the E100, the TIC64, uh, has gotten very, very limited use. Um, so I wanted to kind of touch on that and kind of not really go into kind of how to, but more so like what are some of the issues involved with that? What is it good for? What is it not? How you should and how you should not use it. Um, we talked about some kind of odd and end, some unusual quirks with the, court, the ARM architecture. Um, the C64 is a dedicated fixed point DSP. Let's just not have any doubts. It can do multiple accumulates. It's designed for that. We won't really question the architecture itself. It will do that pipelined um, as parallel units. And we can really expect that to do a multiple accumulate very, very well. Um, so it's really what we, uh, except for the fact that it's fixed point, so you have to keep that in mind as well. So it's fixed point. Um, the factor you do have to take into account is you do have transport. Um, it runs its own operating system, DSP BIOS. So it's, it's nothing like, for example, a multi-core type implementation in terms of where you kind of still have the same OS. No, it's completely separated. Each OS runs distinctly. And you have to explicitly talk between one of the two and coordinate actions. And again, the advantage of being this, the, the C64 is that it, it is dedicated for multiple accumulate operations, DSP. And we're kind of at the point with ARM, well, it is an application processor. It's not a baseband signal processing uh, DSP. It never was. And, you know, we we're at the point where we can use it for that purpose, but it was never dedicated for DSP use. Um, so if we start getting into the C64, that actually carries all the way through. The compiler, the tool chain, these are all meant for uh, DSP purposes. So vectorizing, GCC was, GCC was not. Uh, this compiler is. So we get some pretty, pretty good improvements uh, moving to DSP, as you might expect. So how do you vectorize on DSP? Well, here's one example. We took the same for loop. No intrinsics, no assembly. In general, you stay away from it. Uh, you specify with pragma. Well, here's a for loop. It's going to iterate between 4 and 16 times on multiples of 4. That's your vectorization right there. And the compiler from that will tell you, well, this is how many cycles it's going to take. The loops will unroll based on that pragma. Minimum trip count, maximum trip count, cycle estimation. So this is pretty nice coming from an x86 case. Um, this is a dedicated processor, so you can actually do these kind of things. Uh, when I run on the x86, I stream music from YouTube at the same time. It's, I wouldn't necessarily trust the actual, you know, uh, try to calculate a cycle count from the instructions and then try to measure it. 
there's too many variables involved. But in the DSP case, you can actually do that. So uh, that's probably one of the biggest advantages right off the bat. You can actually do cycle level static analysis and actually be sane. Uh, but again, you have to take advantage of the transport. Uh, Philip made some talk about zero copy, um, but if you look at this from a hardware level, um, some things are going to be expected. Uh, these are separate units. They don't share cache, so you have to interact through external memory. So in terms of that kind of hardware sense, there will be a copy out to external memory and back. You can't get around that. And um, so that's something you really have to take into account. Um, I won't get into some of the details. If you want to talk more about the transport tomorrow, uh, I can do that. But it's, uh, it can be quite involved. So I talked about uh, the theoretical value static analysis. We can actually calculate a cycle count, and, and we can measure against that. So red line is kind of a theoretical value. This is simply out of the DSP lib documentation. It says, this operation, this multiply accumulate, this fur takes this many cycles. It's easy. We can just extrapolate that and just plot on the red line. Um, as we might expect, once we start including transport, our, our values kind of, our gap kind of opens up. Uh, this is a GSM case, so uh, from the bottom going up, uh, it's increased in sample rates. And the main change we see here is as we increase our bandwidth, our transport actually starts getting a lot more interaction. You can think of it one way as kind of like swapping, I suppose. Um, but in this case, it's set up with fixed size message blocks. So as you increase your bandwidth, you have to send more messages. You send more messages, transport overhead. So you have to take, take this into account. Um, especially you see on the far left, you see a flat line. So what that means is if you're going to just send you know, a high amount of data, say oh, two mega samples for whatever, over to the DSP, and you're just going to do a four-tap filter on it and send it back. Um, you might as well go up 12, 6. You might as well do more because you're completely dominated by transport at that point. So you really have to keep that in mind. Uh, of course, how does that compare to neon? Now, this is not this is not going to be an apple to orange or uh, uh, apples to apples comparison. It's fixed point, fixed point versus floating point. One of those transport, but we can get some rough ideas. Uh, as I said, if you're going to do uh, uh, kind of low operations, low filtering operations, you're better off just doing it in neon. If you're only going to do a four eight tap multiply and send it back, then don't bother sending it across out to writing out to external memory, back to the DSP. Um, so, Tom, this time is taking into account the... the yes, answer. yes, yeah. I can't actually... This is just based on elapsed time for 10,000. So I can't measure that on the... I actually can't even measure that on the DSP. I have to measure it, send it out, back, back, and then you know, start, stop. Um, yeah, that is kind of hard to read, but... Um, and I didn't... I didn't this was kind of a little bit more examples here, but it's two, eight, and four samples, so it's difference in sample rate. That's why you see three here. So moral of the story is, is the C64, you really have to have something that's, that's able to make use of it. Um, I was just kind of comparing convolutions in this case, and you can see the, the rise in the end, but it's really not taking full advantage of it. Um, the ideal case in the C64 would be you send something in, you do something fairly high, a series of convolutions, not just a convolution send it back. You do multiple operations, a whole receiver chain, perhaps, and then you write bits out, so low, low bandwidth on the way out. That would be kind of the ideal case. Um, but in this case, I was comparing it to the neon, so I used the same comparisons. And um, you know, we, we see it coming out ahead at the, the higher tap counts, but um, at the lower ones, yeah, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, so that's as far as comparisons go. Uh, to close, I like this line from, from uh, Knuth. Um, so people should have at least some idea what the underlying harbor is like. And I think that kind of summarizes this whole thing. We can't really, you can go from GCC, but you can't do this blindly. You kind of have to on these embedded platforms. You have to know what you're, 
what you have running underneath. Um, GCC will take that into account somehow, but um, you have to look at what it's actually generating because you may not always want to trust it. So, you know, that kind of sums up. Um, as far as the generic, just generic GCC code portability, um, there is to some extent, but you have to keep in mind the hardware peculiarities when you get onto the ARM. Maybe someday that won't be the case, but at least right now, you definitely have to take, um, take hardware issues into account. And that's all I have. So, uh, questions? All right. Um, who did the work on a lot of the work on swapping between the DSP? I mean, that essentially is DSP link. Um, there are various ways around it. I mean, I wrapped it because I find DSP link code absolutely horrendous to look at. It has a lot of capital letters in it. Yeah. Um, it, it, it yeah, almost solely for that, I, I put a wrapper around it. Um, there is a lot of variance in that. Uh, I use a message uh, abstraction for that, and uh, it's one of the more straightforward ones. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you'd get too much improvements as far as latency. If anything, the latency values I showed are actually going to be optimistic because that's assumption of really packing values in and not having a lot of like, uh, blank space in the message buffers. I just, pump, I just push them like, completely full. Uh, in reality, it's, it's actually going to be much more difficult to code that way. Um, again, I, I came at this from an OpenBTS standpoint. I did not actually have that level of efficiency. It's actually much lower. Um, but I'm also passing in debug information, just, again, for sanity's sake. I have debug information, structures, and not just pure samples going in and out. Yeah, yeah. It was actually doing, in this case, it actually was doing that. Um, and kind of along the fixed point thing as well, there's, there's another big factor I didn't really touch on here that when I worked on the DSP turned out to be very significant, and I, I don't think it usually gets taken into account. Um, and that was simply development time. Um, of course, it seems pretty straightforward to go from, at least initially, to go from a, fixed po or a floating point and then move to a fixed point implementation. Until you start linking up components together and you have to deal with overflow and underflow. And a lot of this debugging thing starts to get quite burdensome. Um, so some of those aspects for me turned out to be quite painful that were pretty much I didn't really expect initially. Uh, if you run into a certain issue, you can't just scale a by value. You have to scale it and then you have to go through piece by piece any components you have and make sure it doesn't overflow and underflow at one of those specific parts. And so development time, that can, be, that can add up quite substantially, especially when you get into fixed point. So that's the other factor you have to compare, especially with neon floating point versus C64 fixed point that you have to take into account. But it, beyond that, it is 5 o'clock. Um, I believe we're done for the day. Yeah, I'll make it All right. Mm -hmm.